our eighth message in our sermon series. Um, and through the series, as, I, as I've said every week, that we're reaffirming our mission as this body believers at the First Church of God. Our mission is to, is to help people be disciples of Jesus Christ and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. There's a specific order, as I've talked about. To this, you have to be a disciple before you can ever make a disciple. You can't make a replica of Jesus if you're not a replica of Jesus yourself. And so you has to be a disciple before you can ever make disciples. A true disciple is a person that has answered that invitation that we read in Mark chapter 1, verse 17, that invitation to come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That is a disciple who answers that calling by Christ. And he, answers, he calls each of us into that calling. The one COG de definition that I've come up with for a, de a disciple of Jesus is someone who is following Jesus, is being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. That is what a true disciple of Jesus Christ is. And Jesus died for us to, for it to be possible for us to each experience this life, this, this disciple life that he's calling us to have. And he paid such a high price for us to have that opportunity. And it's, it's basically, he's, he's giving us the opportunity to live the life we were created to live when he died for us. This was the life that Jesus always meant for us to have, uh, that God always meant for us to have when he created the garden. And, and, and we know all about that was the life that we meant to have. And then Jesus died for us to all experience that. But we must come to God and be his disciple in order to do that. That's why in James chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Come close to God, and God will come close to you. So it first starts with us. He's already pursued us. He left the 99 to come after us. But we must come close to God, and then he will come close to us. As we walk with God, you then move into the second portion of that mission statement that we have. To replicate and make more disciples of Jesus Christ. This is God's desire for everyone who is his followers. The Great Commission is, is not optional. I've talked about that consistently. It's not an optional thing for us. Like, oh, you know, half of us can, can live out the Great Commission, and, and the other half doesn't have to. You just keep living your life. No, that's, that's not it. Every single person that has accepted Jesus' gift of salvation is called to be his disciples, to fulfill the Great Commission of making disciples of all nations. A true disciple of Christ is someone who has moved from being a recipient of the Great Commission, has, has been a recipient of the church's mission, to being responsible for the church's mission. That's, that's the difference. You graduate from being the recipient and move on to be the one that is initiating the mission of the church. So my question for all of us this morning, that I'm hoping that we answer, that you're able to answer, is how are you doing at making disciples of Jesus? That's your question. I can't answer that. That's a personal question that God is asking each of you this morning. How are you doing? Especially all of you. This is a message really for all those that know Jesus and have accepted him as their Lord and Savior. How are you doing at making disciples of Jesus Christ? Two weeks ago, I talked about how disciple making should begin in our homes and with our families. Before you move into the world to make disciples of all nations, you need to actively pursue discipleship within your family context, with your spouse, with your children, with your siblings, and even maybe your parents. You don't have to, um, now in that context, you don't have to wait until those, all of your family members come to know Jesus before you can go out and make disciples. I'm not asking you to do that. What I'm asking you to do is, that you need to at least pursue your family first before you go out and make disciples. Because it's, it's, sometimes it's maybe even easier to go make disciples outside of your home than it is for some of the members in your household and in your family. Because some of our family will not accept the, gift of, the, the, the free gift of Jesus offers in salvation. But we must still pursue them first before we go out into the world, and preach the good news. Parents, can I give you some advice? If you are a parent and have young kids, disciple your children early. Don't wait. 
Disciple them as early as you can and do not wait until the world has gotten a hold of them and they start believing the lies the enemy perpetuates all throughout this world and the deceit that he lies to them because it will become much more difficult to disciple your children after they hear and experience the lies from the enemy. That's why it says in Proverbs 22, verse 6, direct your children onto the right path. And when they're older, they will not leave it. See, God knows what he's doing. He's telling us from the very beginning that they take their first breath, begin discipling them. Disciple them to know God, to understand God through your example, so that as they get older, they can tell the difference between the lies of the enemy and the truth of God's word. The truth of God. Then last week, Josh, which I'm very thankful for Josh filling in for me, spoke about the cost that comes with being a disciple of Christ. Jesus paid a very high price for us to be his. But he allows us the choice to accept that invitation into the discipleship process. And before we enter into that abiding relationship that he's calling us to experience, he asked us, as Josh told us, to count the cost. Count the cost of what it would cost to follow me being his disciple. Because following Jesus comes at a cost to each of us. It costs something. Yes, Jesus' salvation, the salvation he offers you, is free. It is a free gift. That is very true. But following Jesus, being his disciple, will cost us the entire world. That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 24 through 26, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if to gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth, uh, worth more than that? Uh, more? Sorry. Is anything worth more than your soul? Jesus is trying to, um, trying to show what it looks like to be his disciple. It's, it's a life that is not selfish, it's selfless. A life that is completely surrendered to God. How? As Jesus said, by dying to yourself. That means everything that you really desire, all of your, all of your desires, your passions, your dreams, and stuff like that, you, you die to it and say, God, I don't, all these things that I want, if they're not yours, if they're not what you want, I will die to them. Because I want what you want for my life. I am yours, completely. Whatever I do throughout my day, whatever I, uh, wherever I work, whatever, I mean, everything, I am yours. Do whatever you want through my life. That's what dying to yourself means. I mean, I want us to think about this for a second. God has given each of us life. Gave us physical life. Every one of us that are alive right now in this world, is, it's, a, it's a gift from God. And then not only that, does he give us physical life, but then he turns around and he, he died on the cross so that we could all experience spiritual life, eternal life through Jesus Christ. So it's not only physical life he gives us, but he gives us an opportunity to have spiritual, eternal life. So then what part of our life is truly our own? None. None of it. It's all his. We can take, he can take any of it away at any time that he wants. So in reality, we are his. We belong to God. And that's the way we should look at our lives, that we belong to God. I know many people want to push back on that and say, well, that that's, doesn't seem like it's free will if we belong to God. I mean, that doesn't, where, where does free will come in that? And, and it does. God, God, we may belong to God. He, he, I mean, he anoints, he appoints a season for all of us to die. And there's no stopping it. Right? And, and he appoints that time. And so we belong to him. But he still gives us the choice all throughout our life. We can choose whatever path we want to go down. There's choices all throughout our life that it's all our decisions, even though he's in control of everything. Because the decisions that I make in life do not affect what God's end result is in the end. Whatever I do is not going to affect what God's plans are in the end for all, for all of humanity and eternity. They're just going to affect my plans and maybe my family. And I find comfort in that. I find comfort in knowing that God is in complete control. Of everything. He's in complete control of my life. But let's go this morning to the Old Testament when God delivered his people out of Egypt 
and made them his own. He chose them. If you remember that story in, in Exodus, he chose the people of Israel and he delivers them out of Egypt. And, and in that process of delivering them out, he provided them as they enter into the wilderness and leave Egypt, provides them with, with water and, and food and shelter throughout the desert and wilderness. And then he conquers the huge, massive Egyptian army that's chasing them down with the Red Sea, parts the Red Sea, and the Red Sea comes crashing, closing down on them and, and killing the entire Egyptian army. Then God shows himself. He brings him to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, and, and he comes down. It's not just he comes down on these plagues or speaks through Moses. God actually comes onto this mountain. I think I have a picture that God comes down. I know this is a cartoon, but this is an illustration. But God comes down. His presence comes down in fire and smoke onto this mountain. It's for all the people. Why, uh, why does he do that? Does he have to do that? He's already talking about us. No, he wants... His people, this, this new group of people, the Israelites, he wants them to see his, his power and his presence on top of this mountain. God completely provides for the Israelites that are his. Even in the hardest environments and circumstances of the wilderness and the desert, God is with them. As they go from place to place as God sends them out throughout this wilderness journey, he went ahead of them. I think I have another picture. Uh, everywhere they camp, there's this giant pillar of fire that raises up, and they follow this pillar of fire to wherever it stops. They stop, and they follow this pillar of fire. Could you imagine being like a, an army that's like around that area that's looking at this group of people and like, whoa, what is that giant fireball that's like coming from the sky? Uh, yeah, maybe we better leave them alone. I'm thinking we might want to leave them alone, right? So this pillar of fire is, is following them or is, is showing them where to go. And God is leading them to every spot that they're supposed to go along this journey and provides for them at each stop. Maybe not exactly that the way they were thinking. I think they thought that maybe it was going to be like a hop, skip, and a jump to the promised land. But God had a plan for them to go to each spot. And as, as, as God stopped them at each spot, if you read his word... It's a perfect spot. It's an oasis at every spot that they go. And God provides water for them and food for them and shelter for them at every spot along the way. It's a perfect plan that God has. Remember, this entire journey was only supposed to take two years. It was only supposed to take two years. And one of those years was supposed to be really a, a, a massive camp out at Mount Sinai. It was only supposed to last a year where they were camping out at Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, where God's presence was so that God could establish the laws and the rules and the order that they needed to do and so that God could show them and they could learn in that year and grow in their relationship and understanding of who God is, where they can grow in trusting him and putting their faith in him. And after that year, they would then march over the 10-day journey, 10, 11-day journey to the promised land where they could learn and trust God to deliver that land to them. They would have been, um, had they not learned to trust God and follow God, they would have been destroyed going into that land. Because they needed to learn to trust God. They couldn't fight the giants and the armies in that land and fight God and his commandments. I think we've all experienced that, right? We have problems in our life and when God tells us to do one thing and we start fighting God and the problems and we can't fight both of them at once. And God needed them to trust him. They couldn't be fighting God and those massive armies and giants at the same time. They needed to put their complete trust and loyalty in God, in Yahweh. And throughout the entire time, God always rewarded their faithfulness when they were faithful and trusted him. We should have the same certainty in our lives this morning. God, God goes before us to prepare the way for us to live within his will. He's preparing a way for us. He's anointing a way for us to go. He also travels with us, just as he did with the Israelites. But just like the Israelites in the wilderness, we must become completely his. God wanted the Israelites to be completely his. He desires us to be solely, completely his. Surrendered to him alone. Every day as his disciples, we should wake up and ask this question. I think I have it on the screen. Lord, how would you have me use my time for you and for your kingdom? And Lord, show me how I can be a living sacrifice for you today. Lord, how can, you, how can I use my time for you this morning? How can I build your kingdom this morning? How can I be a living sacrifice for you today? 
In James chapter 4, verse 15, it actually teaches us how we should reshape our minds to place ourselves squarely into God's will. When it says, what you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Maybe you're thinking this morning, how do you have that kind of obedience? I don't think I've ever had that kind of obedience. God, wherever you want me to go, I'll go and I'll be obedient. Whatever you want me to do, I'll go. Maybe we struggle even to pray that prayer every morning. Maybe we're unwilling to pray that prayer every morning. How do you have that? I want to give you maybe some encouragement. Even the Israelites who saw God do incredible things, I've listed some of them, the Red Sea, coming down on a mountain, providing food from heaven, water to drink, pillar of fire, a mountain covered in fire. Even though they saw all these incredible things and witnessed all these incredible things in the wilderness, they still struggled to be obedient to God. They still struggled. As I said, they should have entered the promised land in just two years. But when they got to the, when they, God sent them out and they went to the promised land on the south side of Canaan, they got to there and they decided to send in spies. They decided to send in 12 spies. And when those spies went in, they came in, they said, hey, we got, we got good news. We got good news and bad news. The good news is, look at these size of these grapes. They're massive. They're huge. The land is truly flowing with milk and honey. It's incredible. It's going to be a perfect land for us. Here's the bad news. The armies are massive. The cities are fortified. And there are giants there. We're all going to die. That's the bad news. But remember, God is the one that sent them there. And so what happens is... Ten of the spies are like, no, we can't go. And they tell all the people, we can't go, we're all going to die. And two of the spies, Caleb and Joshua, are like, no, let's take them. God is for us. Let's take them. We're going to go. And they decide to disobey God, and they decide to turn around. And then they're like, God says, well, Moses is like, well, now you're all going to be cursed. And God's, they're like, oh, no, 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 not, now we'll go. Now we'll go. We don't want to go back in the desert. Now we'll go. And God says, no, too late. Go back. Your children will inherit the land. See, Caleb and Joshua had a faithful and obedient heart to God. The two spies that said, let's go in. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 9, Caleb is giving his reasoning for why he believes they should take the land. When everyone else is ready to run away, Caleb and Joshua are ready to go and attack. He basically says, Caleb basically says that the inhabitants, those, the, the, the armies and the, the giants, the inhabitants' protection has been removed from them. The Lord is with us, so don't be afraid of them. The literal word for protection here is is this word cloud. The cloud that is over them, that has been covering them and protecting them, has been removed by God. Something in the spirit of Caleb and Joshua sensed that God had already done something in the spirit realm even before they got there. And the promised land was ready to fall to God's people. They realized God had already won the spiritual battle to allow them to, the people of God, to conquer his enemies. Caleb knew it was the Lord's battle and not really their battle. Caleb walked in the spirit while others were still walking in the flesh. See, Caleb is the perfect Old Testament model for living in the spirit. Even if everyone else is walking in the flesh, he was still walking in the spirit, just as God calls us to do today. Which is the main point I want us to understand this morning, that you can't follow God's will by making disciples if you are not walking in the Spirit. It's impossible. You cannot make disciples of Jesus if you are not walking in the Spirit of God. I know the calling to make disciples scares a lot of people, just like it scared the children of Israel to enter into the promised land. Scared them. So much so that they went backwards and wanted to go back and die in the desert. And I know making disciples, when I say that, hey, you're called to make disciples, it puts a little knot in your stomach. What? Oh, i got to talk to people about Jesus? Yeah. It brings a lot of fear and anxiety, fearing of failure, change, the unknown of what might happen when I talk to someone about the saving power of Jesus. But if I can go back real quick to the wilderness example I've been using this morning, God makes it very clear that fear is something that belongs to the enemies of God. It does not belong in his children. 
the enemies were the ones that should be scared, wondering, look at this pillar of fire heading our way. Who is this God that's conquering all these armies along the way? Oh, my word, this God loves these people much more than our God loves us, and it should cause fear in God's enemies, not in God's children. When we are, when he is in charge, when we allow God to be in charge, he destroys every obstacle. He literally took a ragtag group of slaves out of Egypt and delivered the land flowing with milk and honey that was a prized possession to them, just handed it over to them eventually. See, God is victorious in all his ways. And there's something that I need you guys to hear right now and understand. God is already victorious. So the mission he's calling us to make disciples, he is already victorious and has already won. You're already on the winning side. It's like when he's called the children of Israel to go to the, the promised land. He's already defeated the army on the other side of the river. You just need to be faithful and go in there. And the, you'll find the victory that's already been won. That's how easy. Making disciples is the same way. Anyone that he leads you to in the Spirit's power, the victory has already been won. You just have to get there and do it. And the victory will be won. Fear comes from a demonic spirit. And faith comes from the Holy Spirit. See, everything God creates, or sorry, everything that God creates, Satan then counterfeits something else in response. When you operate by faith, you are uh, being led by the Holy Spirit. When you're operating in fear, you're being led by an unholy spirit. It's something that destroys you, is out to destroy you and keep you from accomplishing that. The fear of seeing the giants on their side caused them death because they had to turn around and all of the adults had to die. But their kids got to inherit the land. See, when, when you don't go make disciples, you're going to experience death and the inability to experience God's faithfulness through using your life. It's going to cause you to not truly be engaged in what God has called you to do, the way, why he created you to experience, the things he created you to experience. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. When you are fearful and timid, you know that that's not of the Lord. Fear and timidity is not from God. Love, power, self-discipline, that all comes from the Spirit. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, there is no fear in love, and perfect love casts out all fear. Well, where's, what is love? God is love. That's what the Word says. God is love, and in perfect love it casts out all fear. So in God there is no fear. There is no fear. So why can we be fearless? Because God lives in us. This is it. This is what I want you guys to hear. God lives in us. So fear is not of God. And it shouldn't be in you. It should not be in you. When God's presence dwelled in the tabernacle, as we follow this Old Testament story, in the tabernacle, the pillar of fire rested above it. And do you see that all the camp is around it? God, the, the calling was... The tabernacle where God dwelled. So that, that building right in the center of that picture is the tabernacle. That was the temple. And that's where God's presence dwelled. And it was always supposed to be at the center of the camp. Why? To signify that God was at the center of his people. That he was right at the core of them. And that their eyes and their focus were to be on God. Well, guess what, church? For those that have made Jesus the Lord of their life, he rests in the center of of your life. He rests inside of you. He is in you. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. For those that have made him the Lord of their life. That's why I love, last week I talked about it. it was Pentecost Sunday last week and the tongues of fire's significance. We saw the, 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 the pillar of fire and we saw that the mountain was on fire and all these areas, the burning bush, all these elements of, of fire are significance because they're a representation of God's dwelling. And then at the day of Pentecost, flames, tongues of fire came and stood on top of their, uh, right above their heads. Why? Because it's signifying that this is the moment that God's Holy Spirit came and took home residence inside of mankind. That for those that have accepted Jesus' power, the very presence of God is inside of us. Going where we go, 
living where we're living, being wherever we go. The Spirit of God lives in us. That's how you can go by faith and be obedient to God's call to make disciples. That's the only reason, that is the only reason we can go make disciples, is because God goes with us. He goes before us, and he lives inside of us. God does the work through the Holy Spirit living in you. God does this work just like he did the work in the wilderness. God was the one that went ahead of them. He's the one that conquered the enemies. He's the one that did all these things, rained manna from heaven. God does the work. Hear me out. God doesn't need you to accomplish his will. He does not need you. Just like he didn't need the Israelites to walk across the Jordan River and take their sword and swing it and kill the giants, God didn't need them to do that. He didn't need the Israelites to kill the giants. God destroyed many armies and empires along the way. If you read the Old Testament, God, God didn't even have to pick up a, a or didn't have to lift up a sword to kill some people throughout the Bible. But he uses his people to teach us and to show us how we can be his. How we can be surrendered and how he can use us. God doesn't need your resources. He doesn't need us to accomplish his will by building his kingdom with disciples. He doesn't need us to go do that. God invites us. And he allows us into his process. So that he can build, we can, he can through this of process of making disciples, he can build our obedience and our trust in him and our love for him by being a part of this process that he sends us in of making disciples. It's the same reason he used the Israelites in conquering the land of Canaan. He didn't need them to kill the giants. He wanted them to see that if they trust him, he will be faithful and he will do a good work through them. All you have to do is trust him and then he will increase their faith love and desire to follow him. God is all powerful and with the Holy Spirit we have full access to him. And I, I don't think we fully understand the access we have in God's view. Same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you and I. See we are weak on our own but the spirit brings power and authority. The enemy is not scared of you. They fear the one who dwells inside of you. There's a story, an amazing story in Acts 19 uh, about the sons of Sceva. And there's these guys that try to do this incantation. They don't know God, but they've seen, they've seen Paul and, and other people cast out demons. And they're like, man, this looks cool. I think I can do this. I think I heard them do it. I watched them do it. So I think I can do this. But they did not know God. And so they went up to this man who's demon possessed. And they're like, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, I command you to get out of this person. And the demon goes, well, I know Jesus. I know Paul. Who in the world do you think you are? And then it says that the man, the demon turns around and beats the man and leaves him naked to run away. Leaves him naked to run away. So they had no power because they did not have God in them. See, the darkness knows who has the spirit in them. And it quakes in fear for those that have the spirit of God inside of them. You must know God intimately in order to receive the benefits of our king. I feel many of us allow our minds to be stuck in our old slave mentality, slave to sin mentality, and have not allowed ourselves to understand the reality of your life in Christ. You are children of God. Do you understand that power that comes with being a child of God and the benefits that come with being a son and daughter of the most holy God? When we are spirit-led, instead of being led by our sinful flesh, it allows our life to project God's love through the nine fruits of the Spirit. And I have a list of the nine fruits of the Spirit. So instead of anger in our life, we can have peace. Instead of jealousy in our life, we can have joy. And all the other fruits of the Spirit, we can possess those fruits in our life because of the Spirit dwelling inside of us. And the closer we walk with the Spirit, the closer our life will embody Jesus. And the more impact we can have for His kingdom. The Spirit uses our surrendered life to do His good work of bringing life to dead bones. To dead souls. But we must allow the Holy Spirit to transform our life and rely on the Spirit's power for our life. 
Even when we don't understand things or see the full picture that God has put out there, God does. He sees it, he knows it, and the Spirit is going to tell us and prompt us what to do, even if we don't understand it. And the Spirit revealed God's truth to us along the way. 1 John 2, uh, 27, but you have received the Holy Spirit, and he lives within you, so you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know, and what he teaches is true, and it's, uh, it is not a lie. Unfortunately, many don't utilize the Spirit and act as if the Spirit is not in you. So many of us walk around acting like the Spirit of God is not inside of us. Or we've forgotten about it. We say things all the time like, I can't do that. I can never do that. I can never pray in front of people. I can't tell you how many people, times I've heard some of you say that. I can never pray in front of people. I could never preach. I could never share my testimony. I could never share this or I could never tell anyone about Jesus. I, I just can't. It's not in me. I'm too quiet. I'm too shy. I'm not smart enough. Fill in the blank. Friends, when you do that stuff, when you say, I can't do things that God is calling us to do, you're, you're quenching the Spirit. You quench the Spirit. Just by not acknowledging Him. Proverbs 3.6 says, in all your ways acknowledge me. And then Jesus teaches us about how important it is for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to be acknowledged. Their presence acknowledged. Their power acknowledged. Jesus tells us in Matthew 10.32... Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. This is the Holy Spirit's desire right here. For me to do this. Zach, I want you to acknowledge me when you walk into every room. Wherever you go, Zach, acknowledge my presence. If the Spirit was talking to me, this is what he'd be saying to me. Acknowledge me everywhere you go, that I am there with you. In every room you walk in, every place you go, I am there with you. I want you to acknowledge me in all parts of your life. But you're quenching me when you don't acknowledge me. See, it's impossible to partner with the Holy Spirit in your life if you don't acknowledge him. If you don't acknowledge his presence in you, you can't partner with him. Here's what the Holy Spirit would love to hear from us. Holy Spirit, you are here. Please have me. Use me. Your partnership with the Holy Spirit begins with your acknowledgement of his presence. Ben, you go ahead and come up. The struggle you may have, uh, maybe having of thinking, I'm not ready. I know, I, I know as I'm talking about I know as I'm talking about making disciples, it brings up fear and anxiety in your heart. I know that. I know that. This idea of I, I'm not ready, saying I'm not ready, or, or I'm not strong enough, or, or, or I'm not trained. You, you, I'm not trained enough to make disciples. That's, that's a normal response to have. And it's not, a, it's not a terrible response to have. It's actually a response that God prefers God prefers you to come up with tons of reasons to doubt him. Because when you doubt God, then he can give you his power in your weakness. God doesn't want you to make disciples with your own talents and your own abilities. Because you can't make disciples of Jesus on your own talents. They won't last. You can't make disciples of Jesus on your own talents and abilities. He wants you to do it because he wants your surrender. Your abilities don't do much. But the Holy Spirit is a professional and is ready to equip you to do the job he's called you to do. He's really good at doing what he does. He's been doing it for a long, long time. He's been equipping believers for a long time to do God's will. And he's, he's really, really, really good at it. If you just look at the day at Pentecost that we celebrated last week, just through, through 120 people and Peter's sermon, over 3,000 people came to know the Lord in one day. 3,000. Came to know the Lord one day. He is really good at what he does. And, and these people, by the way, are, are not like professionals. They're, not, they're, they're just a bunch of no-name castaways. Cast-offs that no one wanted anymore. Fishermen, carpenters, tax collectors. All these people that God used to save 3,000 people were, were nobodies in that culture. But the Spirit's power inside of them caused them, used them to, to help make 3,000 people come to know, know the saving power of Jesus. 
these, these cast-offs believed, received, and surrendered something, to something far greater than anything the most talented human could ever produce. The very presence of God himself inside of them. They could do anything God led them to do, even defeat giants across the Jordan River. My son um, likes to build forts. He builds forts all the time, and sometimes he wants to move couches around and do things. I remember when he was a little kid, he used to try to move things, and it would be super heavy for him, and he'd be grunting. And I'd hear him grunting, and I'd come over, and I'm like, hey, how you doing? You, you, you got this? You, you're going to do a good, you got this? Yeah, yeah. You're using all your legs? You, you're standing there. And he'd keep pushing and pushing and pushing, and I'd just be like, is he ever going to ask me for help? Is he ever going to ask me for help? I'm just standing there. I'm like, you got it? Keep going. Yeah, keep pushing. And then I'm like, and I'm like hey, um, do you want to ask me for help? And he's like, oh, are you willing to? Absolutely. I'm your dad. I'm your dad. See, church, I know that we have a lot of fear of making disciples, but we have a Heavenly Father who's called us to make disciples, and he's given us everything that we need. You just need to ask. Ask for help. Stop making excuses of why you can't make disciples and figure out that Jesus has, God has given you this whole, the spirit of the living God who dwells in you and you just need to ask and he will do the work that you cannot do on your own. He will do the good work that he's called you to do. Would you all please stand and pray with me?